Trust is not something that happens overnight. This is not something that you can build in the first two or three visits. It's about establishing it over a long time as well. It's about listening. It's about consistency. It's about showing care beyond the physical adjustments. Now, this trust encourages them to not just show up for a few visits, but it can show up for hundreds of visits. For the last six or eight years of practice, my retention, my PVA was well up over 140, 150 visits. This means we didn't have a need for a lot of new patients. When I look back on it, it's because of the trust that I built with the patients in the years beforehand. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, folks. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Marketing Your Practice podcast, the podcast where I have the pleasure of simplifying the marketing and the mindset so you, the chiropractor, can increase your income, your impact, and your enjoyment in practice too. In today's episode, I want to dive into one of the most overlooked yet absolutely essential elements of building a successful chiropractic practice. We're going to be talking all about trust. Here's the truth. Without trust, no matter how skilled you are, no matter how good your marketing is, no matter how good your communication is, your patience will not stay. Now, over the last 25 years, I've been deeply involved in chiropractic. I've worked with countless chiropractic coaches. I've attended seminars that I've literally lost count of. And one of the most popular topics for us to talk about is retention. We all know that we need our patients coming back to them. It's really good for them. That's where chiropractic becomes at its best. And it's great for our business as well. Every chiropractor wants to build a retention-based practice, and we spend hours talking about how to educate our patients and how to get them to understand the value of our care. But when I reflect back on those 25 years, there's something that's almost always been missing. We never talk about trust. We never talk about how to build about how to build trust. The conversation usually centers around education. How do we teach our patients all about chiropractic care and what it can do for them? And sometimes this can even border on manipulation. We can push our patients. We can use fancy language. And sometimes we can overwhelm them with facts and statistics. But we rarely stop to think, what have we simply focused on building trust instead of overwhelming them with information? Now, here's an interesting thought. If a family member, think about it, or a friend or a close one comes to see you, do you give them the same type of education process that you do with a new patient? In many cases, the answer is no. And yet, they continue to come back again and again to get adjusted. And why is this? It's simple. They trust us. When somebody trusts you, the amount of education needed becomes much smaller. Now, I'm not saying we don't need to educate our patients, but I'm just saying the need for education is different. They don't need to be convinced. That's probably the key word there as well, because they already know that you're looking out for them. So today, what I want to do is I want to break down exactly why trust is the foundation for retention. And I'm going to share with you seven actionable tips that you can start using right away to build trust with your patients so you can start seeing greater retention retention, okay? But let's explore a little bit more of the trust-retention relationship. Let's dig a little bit deeper into the idea that trust is what builds retention, not education, okay? Now, at its core, trust is what leads to long-term commitment. When a patient feels seen, when they feel heard and understood, they develop a deep level of trust for you as a chiropractor. Now, if we think about it, one of the primary needs that we have for hu- as human beings is to feel seen and understood, okay? Now, it's absolutely no different from our patients. I want to share a couple of stories that have happened to me over the last few weeks that talk about the impact of trust, what happens when it's established and what happens when it was lost. Recently, I bought a new television and I want it mounted on my wall and I decided I was going to pay somebody to come and do it because I wanted all the cables to be actually hidden away. So I paid a bunch extra to have all of this done. Now, immediately when the two guys walked in the house, and I'm always nervous of strangers walking in my house, you know, I'm careful of my family. I just don't like people being in my house who I don't know. These guys looked at immediately the job that needed to be done. And the very first thing he said to me is, Angus, we can't hide the cables in this situation. You're going to need an electrician to come in and do the job. We'll make sure that we get you refunded for the extra that you had uh, paid to get this done. Now, immediately when this happened, trust elevated. Now, there are a bunch of other questions that I needed to ask Stephen and Dave. These are the guys that actually did it there too. And I took their advice from then on. I trusted them implicitly because when they started off the relationship, they had my best interests at heart. Now, as a result of this too, I've told many people about how great these guys were and I would happily continue to refer them to others. Now, if we contrast this to a week later, I had a whole bunch of the insulation in my roof wanting to be changed. The insulation was old. It's an old house. The roof was full of dead animals and the waste from dead animals there also too. Now, these guys arrived late instead of getting there at 10.30 in the morning. They got there at 3.30 in the afternoon. When they got here, 
The guy didn't know what sort of roof we had. He thought we had a tiled roof and we had a color bond roof. He then didn't have the tool, a simple little drill bit, to be able to take off uh, the roof sheets, so he had to go and find one. Everything about the way that these guys operated was unprofessional and everything that they did eroded trust. Now, as a result of this, before I paid them, I got up into the roof myself. I had to check the job that they'd done. I got into the roof space and I went over it like a fine tooth, with a fine tooth comb to make sure they had done the work they said that they'd done. And all of this because trust was low. Now, if somebody asked a referral for somebody to actually do the insulation in the roof, there is absolutely no way that I would recommend these guys. Now, in a practice situation, when patients trust you, they're not just buying the adjustments, they're buying the entire experience, okay? They need to feel confident that you're guiding them towards the best outcome. And where trust really shines through is it significantly decreases the need for constant education, okay? If trust is high, and again, I'm going to say this a lot of time, there's no need for coercion. There's no, no, again, education is essential. We need people understanding the chiropractic paradigm, but it's not something that we need to ram down their throat, okay? So consider this. When a patient trusts you, they won't question every recommendation, every adjustment, or every visit. You know, when I'm working with clients, then visit number one, before we get to the report of findings, the number one goal of visit one is to establish trust. And if you do that well, then the report of findings is very simple, okay? We don't have to have fancy scripts. Of course, we need to take our way through the steps, but we need to build trust. Education is a part of it. It's incredibly important, but it's less about convincing and it's more about supporting them, helping to guide them gently as one. Here's the crucial point though too. Trust is not something that happens overnight. This is not something that you can build in the first two or three visits. It's about establishing it over a long time as well. It's about listening. It's about consistency. It's about showing care beyond the physical adjustment as well. Now, this trust encourages them to not just show up for a few visits, but it can show up for hundreds of visits, okay? When I finished practice for the last... <clears throat> six or eight years of practice, my retention, my PVA was well up over 140, 150 visits. This means we didn't have a need for a lot of new patients. When I look back on it, it's because of the trust that I'd built with the patients in the years beforehand. So let's start with a really simple definition of, of trust. And then I want to share with you some red flags that might indicate that trust is not what it ought to be in your practice. Okay. So trust is the confident belief in the reliability, the truth, or the ability of somebody combined with the understanding that they have your best interests at heart. Now, in a chiropractic setting, trust means patients believe that their chiropractor is genuinely committed to their health and is going to provide honest and effective care. Pretty simple. Okay. Now, if trust is so important, how do we know if there's a trust issue in our practice? Now, there's plenty of warning signs that might be happening right under your nose, and they all point to a breakdown in trust. These are red flags to look for as well. Okay. The first is patients just not committing to care plans. If you're having difficulties at conversions on day two, or people are not starting the care, this is a trust issue. Okay. It's not always an education issue. If they are starting, but if they're dropping off before their 10th visit again, it's a trust issue. If there's a hesitancy that people have of booking long-term schedules going there and saying, listen, here's my next six weeks, it's a trust issue. If people are asking for a second opinion or if they're delaying starting of their adjustment programs, that's a trust issue, okay? If you're getting feedback like, I'm not sure this is working for me or if I'm not feeling better yet, okay? This is not an education issue. This is a trust issue, okay? Now, notice all of these points I talked about, typically as chiropractors, we think of these as education issues or you're not educating your patients right. You haven't told them the right thing on the new patient visit. You haven't told them the right thing on uh, the report of findings. You need to educate them or you need to send them emails. You need to do these type of things as well. So now that we've identified the signs of trust issues as well. Let's look at how we can go about building trust. I want to share with you seven actionable steps that you can start using today. And I want you to start using them today to build some trust with your patients so that you can see a greater retention. Now, the first one I touched on before, and it's just this, always have your patient's best interests at heart. I was having lunch last weekend with Martin Harvey and Brad Glowacki, and we were talking about some of the questions that we get as coaches, and we're talking about the solutions. And Brad said this interesting thing. He goes, just be cool. Like the answer to almost everything, well, what if a patient wants their money back? Well, just be cool. What if a patient is feeling sore after the adjustments? Well, well just be cool. Now, a version of just being cool and, and just being cool means just being kind, 
okay? Just being nice. Always have the patient's best interest at heart. This is where the foundation of trust comes. Now, yes, we have a business to run. Now, this doesn't mean what I'm not suggesting because having the patient's best interest at heart in my thought, is giving long-term recommendations, telling the truth of what happens if they don't get their subluxations corrected. Tell them the truth of what happens if they just deal with their symptoms and they don't get to the core of what's going on, okay? When they sense that your primary focus is on helping them, not on helping you, trust elevates and we're able to back that up again and again and again, then you will reap the benefits of trust, which is a really high retention practice. I would often think, what would I tell my mum in this situation? What would I tell my sister in this situation? Or what would I tell my best friend in this situation? Okay. This was something that I would say all the time. In fact, I would often say that. I said, if you were a great friend of mine, if you were a brother or sister and you're asking me this question, this is exactly the referral that I would give you. Okay. So step number one is make sure that you are always having the patient's best interest at heart. Trust that. Now, I know that you need to grow your practice. I know that you've got bills to pay and staff to pay, mortgages and all those type of things there. And if you just always have their best interest at heart, those things will always get looked after. I know it's a cliche, but patients don't care how much you know until they know how much that you care, all right? So this is about being transparent up front in your recommendations and explaining why certain decisions are always going to be made. The second thing is to continue to work on your active listening. I've talked about this previously on the podcast because it is one of the most valuable skills that you can have. One of the quickest ways to lose trust is to fail to listen. Now, again, we can be looking at people in the eyes, but we can still be not listening. Listening is a skill that you need to develop. Often when we're in conversations with people, what we're doing is we're waiting for a break in the conversation so we can say what we want to say instead of truly listening to them, okay? It was Stephen Covey that says, you know, instead of, uh, I'm going to butcher this a little bit there too, but seek first to understand before wanting to be understood. There we go. We got it in the end. That means all communication really begins with listening. This means that when we're listening to people too, we want to often stop and double check. I just want to make sure that I'm hearing right. This is what you're telling me. We use their language. This is a really important thing, okay? So we're actively listening by nodding our head, by saying things, okay, I got it. Tell me more. This is one of the things I learned from the amazing Russ Rose and one of the most powerful ways to work on our active listening is to let people, you know, tell me more. And often we don't want to hear this because if somebody's having a bit of a rant but they're feeling sore or this is going on there too, we want to move beyond that. We want to tell them that symptoms aren't important and this is what's happening, their body will get there. But if you stop that and you actually look and you take a deep breath breath, and you say something like, I'm really sorry to hear that, tell me more. When we can actually break into that and we can let people have their rants, my experience is most patients won't continue to rant and rant and rant. So a practical tip during your consultations, during your adjustments, your report of findings, these kind of things, reflect back what the patient shows that, uh, has said to you to show that you're truly listening. Use their own words to make sure that you're mirroring their concerns. Step number three, if we want to build trust, is to educate, don't dictate, okay? So rather than overwhelming them with facts and directives, you know, in my initial consultation for the longest time, well, for the first few years, I would literally get into the Harvey Lillard story. I would take them right back to what started with chiropractic in the beginning there too. I was overwhelming them. The early phases, the initial consultation is all about them. It's about connection. It's about making them feel seen and heard. This is not where the education goes deep as well, okay? Now, one of the ways that we educate is that we tell stories, We tell stories and we have metaphors, okay? So we might be saying, listen, our adjustment plan is a bit like servicing your car. Our car needs to be serviced regularly. That's what keeps it running well. Your adjustments are the same. So sometimes we get stuck into anatomy and physiology and we go into the neuroanatomy and we're using big words when simple metaphors will work. You know, I was a big fan of talking about the smoke alarm in in our houses because we understand that if our house is on fire, we don't want to just put out the smoke alarm. We need to put out the, the fire underneath it as well. And that would be the way that I would connect symptoms and then the root cause of it as well, okay? So use simple analogies and examples that they can relate to. Okay, as an example, I said before, the spine is like a car and it needs regular maintenance to run well. Now, step number four, if you want to build trust is transparency in your care plans and your recommendations. This is about being open and honest about the process, the timeframes and the potential results. Now, one of the things that I would say is as I would give my recommendations, I'd get to the end of it and I would say these are based on the best information that I have right now. 
now. And it can change. Sometimes it's quicker, sometimes it takes a little bit slower, but we're only going to know this as we start to begin the process. And everything is up for discussion. Now, I wanted to let them know that they had choice in amongst this process. Now, I realized over 25 years that there were situations sometimes when people started three times a week, they couldn't and they started twice a week and sometimes they still did great. Okay. Sometimes it just took a little bit longer, but I was open for investigating. Now there is a time where we have to draw a line in the sand and say, look, this is not worth us starting. If we're going to just start once a week and we've had this problem going on for a long time, I don't think we're going to get the results that you need, but I'm going to show that in a way and I'm going to build trust and I'm going to let them know that it's about them, not about me. Okay. So in your care plans, be really transparent about the time it's going to take. Nothing will have your road trust more than saying to somebody, I think we're going to get this sorted in the next six weeks and if it takes eight weeks. Okay. So if anything, what I wanted to do is overestimate the time. If you get there faster, then even better. It's another reason why to make sure you know, we have people on the right care plans because the longer it takes, if it takes longer than what you recommended, you're going to erode trust. That's why we must be making sure we're delivering great adjustments at the frequency that's required and giving them the home support that they need as well. Step number five is consistency in communication. Make sure that you and your staff, so your CAs, are delivering the same message across every interaction. If you're talking about the importance of consistency of your adjustments, okay, that's the conversation that you're having, but your front desk are not mirroring that. They're just saying, no, listen, it doesn't matter if you can't make Thursday. I know you've got that important meeting at work. We'll just see you next Monday. That's going to erode trust. We want the front desk person saying the same thing. Look, it's important that you stay on your schedule at this time, okay? Angus recommended twice a week. If we miss that adjustment, that can slow us down as much as a week. Can we get you in on Wednesday or Friday? How do we do that? Mix messages or change in tone or what you're talking about, okay, is going to undermine trust. Now, this means also as you're communicating through with your patient on a visit to visit basis. If you talked about this being important, make sure you follow up with it, okay? So develop a communication plan where the key points are reinforced at every stage of the patient's care journey from the initial case, from the initial consultation all the way to the check-ins, all right? The message is the message is the message. If it's important, then stick to to it as well. A great way for building trust is showcasing proof. Now here in Australia, whilst we're not able to advertise with testimonials, APRA is happy for us to be sharing testimonials on a one-to-one basis because we can build more context into it, okay? One of the ways that I educated, in fact, the primary way that I educated my patients is I just shared stories, okay? It's a great way for us to educate our brains are wired to listen to stories more than they are to want education. No one comes along to their chiropractor wanting to be educated, but we love to hear stories. We have a brain built on millennia of hearing stories, okay? So share success stories, particularly related to the person that you are speaking with. If you've got somebody that's got a cranky sciatica and you know, you're a few weeks into care and it hasn't changed yet, then share a story with them about another patient where it took time, but they stuck to it and they followed through. Or sometimes what I would do is I would share stories of patients that dropped out of care too quickly and I'd share the consequences of that. We want to do it in a non-preachy way and we want to get good at our storytelling as well. Okay, so regularly share real life stories, success stories and those that didn't turn out so great as well through your conversations. Okay, and if you can, do this in your social media and your marketing channels as well. Okay, and the seventh And I believe possibly one of the most important things that you can do here is build an emotional connection, okay? So patients stay long-term when they feel an emotional connection with you, okay? Now, this emotional connection comes when we share or small personal touches. We remember their family members, okay? We ask about their life events. We simply show genuine interest for their overall life. Now, I made a note of remembering their work and their work colleagues, if appropriate. I wanted to know their husband or their wife's name. Now, ultimately, I wanted them under care and their kids as well, but I remembered these things. Now, sometimes I had a great memory for this, but often what I did is I just jotted down a little note and I wanted to make sure that I was following up on these details. My goal here was to be having an ongoing conversation with somebody and sometimes there was a week or a month in between it, but I wanted that conversation to just left off. How did you go with a work promotion? Did you get it? Okay. What happened on the holiday? How was Italy? Did the kid love it? Did the kids love it? And it felt like to my patients that they were often the, you know, in an open plan area 
just a little bit. We were touching this. I wasn't spending a long time with their adjustments. It was two, three, four minutes. But I wanted to just touch base on that same conversation and move forwards with it. So clearly, we didn't do a lot of talking, but there was a lot of connecting, okay? And I also wanted to let them in on my life as well. Now, there are certain things that were private to me, but they knew the name of my kids and of Lauren, and they would ask about them as well. It was this deep sense of emotional connection that we had between the two of us that meant the relationship wasn't just about the adjustment. There was an emotional connection there that really built trust, okay? When we build trust, the need for coercion, the need for us to constantly educate our patients starts to decrease. This means it takes the pressure off. We've got time here as as well. So let's quickly review those seven steps and then we will wind all of this up, okay? So step number one is just simply this, have their best interest at heart. The next time that you're giving recommendations, the next time you're showing up for a practice member, just check in. Is this best for them Or is it best for me? We must be making decisions that are best for them. And I believe that in the long term, the decisions that are best for patients will also be best for you as the chiropractor as well. Work on your active listening skills. If you want to do a deeper dive into that, then do a search. Get on tired of YouTube or Google as well. Read books about active listening. Develop this skill here. Active listening will make you a better chiropractor. Remember to educate, don't dictate. Take it slowly. Build up your list of analogies. Okay, keep it really simple and focused on them. Transparency in your care plans. Okay, let them know why you're recommending, what you're recommending as well. And in my situation, I wanted to make sure that there was choice for them. When we don't offer choice, when we push people into a corner, it's hard for them to make a decision and we lose trust. If there's only one avenue to go down, then our trust spidey sense is going to sort of pop up as well. Make sure there's consistency and communication with what you're saying with the practice members, but also across the whole team. If and when possible, showcase proof. Teach through stories. Now, we can, as I mentioned before, if you're an Aussie doc, we can share testimonials one-on-one. And the final point is build an emotional connection. If you're wanting a practice that's built on retention, and you should, because the longer somebody is under chiropractic care, the more power, more power chiropractic is, and the easier um, our, our practices are also. The fundamental thing that you should be working on is building trust. I'm not suggesting that you don't work on your communication. I'm not su- suggesting that you don't work on your education. What I am suggesting is that you need to be building a foundation of trust. And when you do this, your attention will elevate to incredible records. As always, folks, thanks for all that you do. Keep saving lives. Your community needs you building more trust with them because that's what will change lives. Until next time, see you back here next week. Bye. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, you have to come and check out my Community Influencer Program. It's my monthly coaching program where we take all this material and I'll work with you to help you apply it, implement it, and systemize it. The Community Influencer Group Coaching Program is designed to help you increase your practice income, impact, and enjoyment. Join me over at angusPike.com forward slash join. That's angusPike.com forward slash join. I'd love to see you there.